Welcome everyone to today's uh, presentation. This is actually part two of a two-part series about moving from uh, prototype to production. And so we, of course, there's a much longer process and our uh, presenter today, Anna Thornton, has actually written a book that I think I actually took out of my office. Um, Gosh, I've got a copy. Yes. Because yeah. uh, I'm, I'm at home. So yeah, there's the there's the book. Uh, I'll post the information. Oh, I don't know why it's deciding to, I guess now I got to put it up next to my face for it not to fuzz out. Yes. Yeah, there we go. It is blurring you out, but so product realization, and we'll post the link. Uh, there are resources on her website that are available um, that may be of assistance with uh, just on the website. Of course, you can also purchase the book through the website, but the purpose of our discussion today is really to um, access some of the early information that is in the, in the book that talks about, um, I think, where a lot of our startups are, which is moving from, uh, from this idea of having a prototype into being able to figure out how do we actually manufacture this product. So uh, Anna has uh, met many different experiences working with um, companies, both large and small, um, and now she is a faculty member at Boston University. She was connected to us um, via some, some of our friends from John Deere uh, in the research park. So we are grateful to have her with us today and um, grateful for her presentation last week. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Anna Thornton for today's second edition of, uh, of, of this workshop series, today's being defining the product and process. So thank you so much. Great, um, nice to meet everybody. Um, so uh, I would like to make this as uh, interactive as you guys would like, instead of me just kind of talking at the screen. Um, so um can people just very quickly share sort of where they are in their product are they close to thinking they're going to get into production if you guys want to type it into the chat that way i've got a sense of sort of where you are in your thought process of um of getting whatever uh initiative you're doing um off the ground so uh, feel free to type that in and also please ask questions as we go along uh, i'm happy to I'm the master of tangents. Um, I'm happy to go down a tangent if that adds more value um, than just me giving the slides and giving the slide deck. So a lot of this material is in the textbook. Um, but uh, so what I wanna do today is really talk about um, another big issue that I see when companies start to transition their product into production. So the first is, and we talked about this last week is, they start too early. They're not really ready to go into production. They start early. And when you start going into production too early, you end up burning through a lot of cash because that's when all of your expenditures start. That's when you start having to buy tooling. That's when you have to start paying factories. That's when you have to start buying parts. Um, and if you haven't done that initial work ahead of time of getting ready for production, you're not going to do terribly well when you get there. Um, if you're not ready, and you're going to end up spinning your wheels and wasting your time. So better to do that when your cash flow is low than when you're spending a lot of money. So the next big thing that people do, and I would say the next biggest mistake, is people underestimate or don't really understand what information they need to define and have documented before they go into production. So First of all, a CAD program or a CAD rendering is not a product. And we're going to talk about all the different documents and definitions that and things you need to think about before you start going into production in order to be ready. And a lot of these, as you generate them, are going to generate more questions than answers. Um, and it's a good way of checking to make sure that you actually your product is actually ready for production. So a little background about me. Uh, Laura gave a quick introduction. Started life as an academic, went into industry for about 20 years, worked in everything from um, startup space to Boeing um, and what you would call industry agnostic. Um, I, I played with, I literally worked on the railroads for six months um, in the deep south of Alabama, um, helping crews become more efficient. That was probably my most rewarding project I've ever done uh, to mil uh, military projects, to bicycles, to white goods, to electronics, et cetera. So I've had a really fun set of experiences and I've seen um, a lot of great practices and a lot of really not so great practices. 
Um, and since in the last four years, I've been a professor at BU, taking that experience, marrying it with the academics um, to create courses that begin to kind of marry that theory about how we develop products with the practicality of what it really takes. Product realization was a course I built where students learn how to take a concept and bring it through to production. So they build a DVT unit, EVT units, PVT units. So they build one, five, and then 10 um, of each of their products. And they have to generate all of the documentation. And they do a lot of design iterations between it. Um, and when I developed that course, what I quickly discovered is, is that there is no textbook on this subject. Because um, when I went to find readings, there weren't any. I started writing up my notes, and before I knew it, I had an actual textbook, um, and then sold it. And then I had to completely rewrite it so that it was actually readable. But um, it's been a it's been a process. This pro the book uh, was launched back in January, um, and uh, it's getting, uh, which I'm quite pleased that it seems to be getting a lot of really good reviews, and people are finding it helpful. Because again, it wasn't none of it is new. It's not any new concepts, but it's sort of the first time all of the material required to bring a hardware product into production is in a single location um, as a single reference source. So I'm sure um, there are errors in there. If you read it and have questions, you're always welcome to reach out to me uh, through LinkedIn or other pathways, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, the other thing I do as part of my life at BU is I'm now the director of Epic, which is our large manufacturing makerspace um, where we get to build stuff. And this is really where you take an idea and it's you've got this theory, you've got a bunch of lab stuff, and then you've actually got to produce it using production intent equipment. Um, and this is our lab. This is the lab where we get to see what really happens when that theory hits a reality. In the same way that you can have theory about whatever science you're working on and then you do an experiment, there's a similar transition from that experiment um, into production. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen to make that product actually be launched. And so that product realization is really starting at that looks like, works like prototype. Um, where you've got a technology, it works, you've got something that sort of looks okay, and then you have to have a final full product. Um, and there's an incredible amount of work that occurs between that pilot or that, that prototype and that final pr uh, product that can actually be sold. And to support the production of that, you have to create a set of information that tells the factory what you're gonna build, how you're gonna build it, how you're gonna test it, how is it going to be packaged, et cetera? So what I wanted to do today was really talk through some of those documents or some of that information that you may not even be aware has to be created um, so you're not caught out. Because what you don't want to do, which happens to a lot of the clients that I've worked with, is you start talking to factory and they go, oh yeah, we're ready to produce, but oh, by the way, we need your, uh, your graphics for your startup guide for your, uh, to get FCC certification. And you go, what? Huh? I, FCC certification, startup guide, what is that? Why do I need that documentation? And that's when teams begin to scramble, They're usually at the last minute, and you're having to generate this material and go and get these certifications or create this documentation um, at a time when you really don't have time to do that. In addition, because you haven't thought it through, you may not have room in the packaging, you might not actually be able to pass FCC certification, you may not have left space on the device to have your label for FCC. Um, so if I've just said about 10 or 15 words that you have no idea what I'm talking about, okay? Trust me, you are not alone. Um, the fact that you don't know any of these terms means you have to go out and learn them. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk through some of these terms that when you walk into a factory, they're gonna be talking at you a mile a minute like I am um, and you're gonna have to play catch up. So hopefully what this will do is at least you'll begin to recognize some of these terms as you go along. And by the way, uh, in the back of the textbook and also on the website, um, the productrealizationbook.com, I actually have a glossary and it's a very long list of terms that you may not be uh, familiar with. Um, keep it on your phone, do what I do sometimes, which is I keep it on my phone, I surreptitiously Google words that I don't really understand what they're talking about when I'm in a factory. Happens to me all the time, even now. Every company's got its own jargon, every process has its own terminology. 
and I'm constantly playing catch up. Um, and that's just part of the game. Learning how to do that is part of being able to work in this space. Okay, so slide from last time. You know, most people focus on the first mile, people focus on the last mile. And the question is, how do you get between those two? And I'm just gonna talk about some of that information you need to generate to get you from that prototype into that production. Okay, so how do you get to success? So one, you have to assume you've got a product your customer wants to pay for. Um, and to get there, and again, this is a slide from last week, you have to have a mature design, a target cost, quality on schedule. So you have to have all of these pieces in place. And oh, by the way, all of this stuff has to be written down. And there are standard ways that this material is written down so that there's no confusion about what you are trying to generate. Okay? So you have to define all of these things. You have to write these things down. You have to make decisions about these things. Um, my daughter's kindergarten teacher had this uh, great phrase, which is, uh, if you don't ask for it, you get what you get and you don't get upset. Um, and so if you don't write this stuff down, if you are not incredibly clear about what you want your factory to do, they will do what is expedient for them or what they think you want, not necessarily what they, what you actually want. So this is the point where a lot of entrepreneurs start to glaze over because you're going from this, oh, it's so much fun, it's cool, I'm experimenting, I'm building prototypes, I'm trying a whole bunch of stuff, to all of a sudden you've got to become incredibly operationally uh, efficient and you also have to become incredibly exact and precise. So there's a bit of a mental shift around this time going from this, I'm just gonna share documents, Google Docs, et cetera, to having to have this controlled set of documents that is that complete definition of that product. So any questions so far? Okay, so as you are going through this process, you have to set your factory up. You have to set the production system up enough that you can answer these questions. And a lot of these questions are going to be um, not only testing the product, but also testing whether or not all these other things that you've defined actually get you what you want. So again, we go through these phases of, is the technology ready? And you probably have got some answers to that. But in order to say, is the product design ready? Um, Yes, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Yes, thank you, Greg. I agree with that on that term. Um, so is the product design ready? Okay, well, you have to define what that product design is. We're gonna talk about all the documents you've got to create to define exactly what that product design is. You have to say, is the production system ready? Which means you also have to define if that production system, uh, what is that production system? What is involved in that? And then can it operate at full volume? Again, that's around defining that product, uh, that production system. Now, a lot of the production system will be set by your factory, but it's always within the context of your documentation or your specification as to what you are considering success. And all, all through all of these is you have to have a good specification document. You have to write down what is success because if I say, is the product design ready? You have to have a very clear definition of what ready is. And you have to have an agreed upon definition of what ready is because your factory may say, you said it was okay. You didn't write this down. You're not seeing it as being appropriate or correct. And that's where you start having conflict over what was contractually obligated, what was not contractually obligated. So behind all of this, you have to have that definition of what is ready and what is good. Um, and that's where that documentation or that product definition comes in place. And this again occurs through a series of pilot processes. And these are some of the terms that I'll be using. And we go through a technology readiness, which is the focus of the first talk. We go through an engineering validation testing. And if you notice these terms actually say engineering validation testing. And what we mean by that is you are validating um, that you are meeting the engineering intent. So what is integral between the pilot processes is this idea of testing. So you're not just building pilot prototypes or you're not just building samples or you're just not building things for the sake of building things, you're building them to test them. And when you go to build something to test it, you have to define what is that test and what is success. 
And what do you do if it doesn't achieve that success? So if there's any dispute as to what is acceptable or what is the test or how is it being evaluated, or you just build to build, you're not gonna have that information and that feedback or those learning loops to be able to make that improvement for that next stage. So you can't accurately answer that question. Is the product design ready? Is the production system ready? Am I ready for full production? Okay. So you have to have that definition of success in there. And again, we kind of go through these standard phases of engineering to design to production validation um, and different companies use different terms. Some uses EPD, PPP, some do like T1, T2, T3, T4. But when you look at a company or if you're in a, an organization, there will be these series of pilot phases um, and they will roughly map to those kinds of questions. So there's always gonna be again, a context for that. Okay, so what are all the documents that you are gonna have to create in order to get yourself into production. We'll go through some of these in, in a little bit more detail. Um, the first is this idea of a specification document. So this is what you use to define success. The next one is your product definition. So how are you defining your product design? And that includes your drawings, your bill of materials, and your CMF. Anybody know what I'm talking about about a CMF? Okay, so. People don't, yeah. So CMF color material finish, we'll go over what that is. So again, there's a lot of these things that they're gonna, your factory is gonna say, where's your CMF document? And you're gonna kind of go, uh. Um, so you have to be able to specify that. There is a process definition, which most of the time, we're not gonna go into a lot of details around this, but that's your process flow, your process plan. You have to define your quality test plan. How are you going to decide whether or not it's acceptable or not? Again, if you don't define what your quality test plan is, your factory is going to test what is easy, not necessarily what reflects the actual quality of the product. And we talk about the pilot, the production and the control plan. You have to have a cost model. You always are gonna be having to keep track of those costs. That's not something that you want to have just kind of happen as an outcome. Um, you want to be controlling that and seeing that. That's an iterative process. So you're looking what your design requirements are. You, you, know, you don't calculate y equals f of x once. It's iterative. You, yeah, x being your inputs, your design functions, y being your cost. You're going to calculate your cost and you're going to make changes and adapt and make decisions based on that cost. Because that's one thing that can really get away from you as you're designing your product or as you're going through this process, it's always really tempting because you've just gotten a huge bucket of cost money from some investor. Got the, and it seems like a lot of money to you. It's amazing how fast you're gonna burn through that. And people always assume that they can get the costs down in the second generation. 80% of your costs are gonna be built before you start piloting. So you really have to uh, get control of those costs as early as you can um, and understand those costs as early as you can so that you have a chance to make those changes when you have the flexibility before you're locked into your design. Um, so you're gonna wanna have a part cost, your cash flow, or your cost of goods, uh, your landed costs. There's a lot of terminology just around costs that are important to understand. And then you're gonna have to say how this thing is gonna get shipped. Um, people always leave packaging to the last minute. It always bites them in the backside. Um, Packaging requires a lot of time and a lot of iterations. Um, and uh, it, is, uh, it, can, it can literally make or break your product. It can literally break your product if you're not careful. Okay, so let's go through some of these. So your spec. So your specification document defines what is success. So it includes all the aspects of all your design goals, but it also includes information about your function. So if I were to say, say my computer mouse, okay. I use this exercise when I'm teaching. Um, so if I have a computer mouse, anybody want to type in a, uh, a spec that would be common in a computer mouse? Laura, what would you say is a specification for your computer mouse? What would be a functional requirement? or you can come off speaker, it clicks. Okay, so it actually has to be, you know, so there's some kind of force actuation, right? Okay, it's probably gotta be accurate within a certain amount of time, okay? Um, 
it's probably got to like what else could be in the, so click pressure yep so click pressure accuracy um it's got to be ergonomic so that's a design issue okay so these are all those things how much of my mouse do you think actually is spent clicking how much of the time of my of my mouse's life does that have to is that going to be clicking probably only three to five percent of its entire life okay this mouse has to survive my purse okay which is the ultimate test of a product durability now i don't have small kids anymore um but i do have a lot of stuff in my purse this thing has got to survive okay it's got a it, i've got several cups of dead coffee some of which is on my desk okay it's got to survive my coffee it's got to survive all these things so if you only define the fact that this thing is going to click, you're not going to be defining its entire life of its product. So the specification document defines not only its function and its use, but its quality, its reliability, its compatibility. So is it a USB? Is it a USB-C? Is it um, like what kind of connector is it? What does it need to fit with? What are those sizes of hands? Who is going to be using it? Um, so that spec document needs to be incredibly comprehensive and completely define success for the product. Um, I have online in the um, uh, on the website, I have a template that I use for my students on spec documents, and it's 17 pages long. Okay. There are 17 pages of materials that you need to define in order to fully define success of a product um, with a whole bunch of different boxes in there. And if we have some time at the end, I can, I can go through that. But the reason why we do a specification is one, we have to be able to design it. You have to design it right. So if everybody has a different mental image of what that product is gonna be, you know, Somebody's going to be designing a mouse that's big and clunky and is really, because you know what, they're a gamer and they're going to design it because they're a gamer. And then there might be a mom who has to design it to live in the purse. And maybe there's a person who's got a bad back and they're designing it because it needs to be small and light. Okay. And if each of your design team members is designing to a different image of what that product is, you're going to end up with a Frankenstein of mouses. Okay, so you have to write it down in order to design it. You then also have to build it right. So we select our manufacturing processes, our finishes, our, um, our tooling, our materials, our quality tests. But we're going to do a bunch of things that we're going to design our factory to be able to build that correctly. So we're going to use that specification document to make sure that the processes we're selecting are going to achieve that design as specified. We're then going to test it and you're gonna test the bejeebers out of your products, I hope. Let me rephrase that as a statement. Test your, the bejeebers out of your product because if you don't find a problem, your customer will find that problem. You don't wanna have your customer find it. So you wanna be able to test it. So you have to be able to, if you're gonna test it, you have to have something to test against. And then you also have to be able to diagnose it more times I have seen where I've had a customer get an early prototype and they pick it up and they play with it and they go, yeah, the battery life isn't long enough. Okay. Well, is a battery life not long enough because I spec'd it wrong? My spec said two hours, it lasted two hours, but my customer wants four, which is very different from I spec'd it for it and it only lives for two. I need to know what was I designing to, what did I get, because if I am, say it's the first one, say it's my customer wants four, but my battery's designed to two and nobody's written that down, you may spend a whole bunch of time trying to fix a battery that will never get you four hours. Okay. Versus I'm going to replace a battery and my, you know, say it's the other way. I spec it for four and I'm only getting two, you replace the battery, but if you haven't changed your char charging circuitry, you're never gonna fix that problem correctly. So you use that specification document to really understand, you know, where are you on that? 
you know, so you've got to be able to diagnose it and then be able to design it. So that spec document, again, the more precise and the more accurate, you're not going to be facing that you get what you get and you can't get upset because you haven't written it down. You have to write it down and you have to get agreement on. Okay, so the next thing is, is your CAD. So CAD is not the same as a drawing. So when you go from the spec document to your design, so if I look at, um, say, a Lego, I can very easily generate a surface model, but that does not mean that I can actually make a Lego. That that drawing is then going to have tolerances and datums and dimensions and GD and T. And again, if I've just thrown out three words that you have no idea what I'm talking about, you're going to have to learn it. That drawing is then going to be used to generate tooling which is another set of drawings, that tooling is gonna then set that process design. It's gonna set my feeds, my what we call feeds and speeds. Um, it's gonna define how I'm gonna measure it. What do I define as success? And then ultimately it's gonna get the part. So going from a surface model to a part, you can't just go from the CAD to a part. And 3D printing has got, given us a false sense of security that that's the case. But I will promise you that if you take a surface model and you print it, you will not get what you expect. Okay? You will get something different than that surface model. Whatever you print will be a different size and a different shape and a different um, dimensional instability, depending on what printer type you have. But you will never be able to exactly replicate a CAD file into a physical geometry without going through these series of steps. Okay. So you have to have a CAD. So the next thing, you know, when you're defining the difference between CAD and a drawing is, is you have to have a number of factors in it. You have to have the geometry. You have to fully dimension the product such that your manufacturer can actually read it. Even if you just do a very quick look at how do you do standard dimensioning, always picking a single datum, Again, if I'm throwing out terms that you don't understand, datum is a baseline against which everything is measured. It basically reduces the amount of variation in a part if you have common datums. Your different ways of dimensioning a part can have very dramatic impacts on the quality of your part. So even just changing a location of a dimension can really mess up a part um, in a very dramatic way. Um, you have to have tolerances, what's acceptable and what's not. You can't just say, I need a hole that's one, one inch or a centimeter, because I don't, is it plus or minus a thou? Is it plus or minus 10 thou? Is it, what is that tolerance? What is considered to be acceptable? And when you get really specific, you start doing what's called GD and T tolerancing, which gives you very, very clear specifications as to what, how that tolerance is measured. You have to say what material you're making this out of. Now, there is no such thing as plastic, okay? There is no, like you can't just say the material is plastic. There is no such thing as plastic. Um, you have to be as specific as you can. And again, because somebody is likely to change it. So if you specify Delrin, or if you specify acetyl homopolymer, you might get Delrin, you might get a generic and they can have very, very different material properties. So a 6061T6 is a 6061 aluminum. It's a fairly standard aluminum. A T6 is a certain tempering. That to me shows a very, very high yield strength, uh, but it tends to be brittle and it's really bad at being bent. And if I don't put that T6, I might get a zero, which is easy to bend, or I might get a T6, which is hard to bend. So depending on the function, et cetera, you can have very dramatic changes in the material property. So you have to be as specific as you can about the material. And you also have to say what that finish is. Is it a high polish? Is it a rough polish? Is it tool marks available? Um, and that then comes into your, what we call the CMF or your, uh, your color material finish drawing. Okay, so you have to have all of these things in your part drawings. So the next thing you have is what's called your bill of materials. Now your bill of materials is every single item required to build a product. You have to, again, every single thing, including tape, screws, rubber bands, if it's being held together with rubber bands. Uh, if there's a temporary tape that they, you then pull off, you have to include that in the bill of materials. And that bill of materials, make sure that whatever your factory is gonna build, that they buy all the right parts. You don't wanna get into a build and discover, oh wait, I forgot a screw, wait, and, you know, and you've got to build it and it's a weird screw and you can't get it ordered from Granger for three days. That bill of materials has to be comprehensive. And that bill of materials is a central, central document. Um, 
that you have to keep track of. And it helps you with cost estimate, it helps you with your cost management, with your material ordering, your quality control, your change orders. Um, the whole GM uh, fiasco with the ignition switch was actually a bill of materials and a design change, drawing change that was not tracked correctly. Um, there can be legal implications and regulatory implications if you're doing medical devices or anything that is a regulated device. Uh, your bill of materials is what's called a controlled document, which means you can't change it without notifying people. Again, that's how GM got themselves in trouble. So that bill of materials has got a whole bunch of stuff in it, um, including a part name, a name, a description, a quantity, cost, extended lead time, MOQ, your minimum order quantity, uh, what type it is. So this is a really important uh, detail to know when you're doing your bill of materials, the difference between consigned, assigned, and generic. Um, and this says basically whether or not your factory can replace it. So if I say Loctite and I call it generic, it means that that supplier can use any equivalent Loctite. If it's assigned, it says I have to uh, you have to use this specific Loctite 707D or whatever it is. You have to use that and you cannot change it. And then consigned means that you are responsible for purchasing it and getting it to the factory. And there's a bunch of subtleties as to why we consign certain things and why we don't, having to do with pricing, uh, intellectual property, uh, supply chain issues, uh, partnership deals, et cetera. There's a bunch of reasons why we consign products. Um, but you're going to have to be familiar with those differences. Who's making your part and what your manufacturer part. So this document tells you exact tells your factory exactly what's required to build that product. Okay. So in addition to your CAD and to your um, drawing, you're going to have a document called your CMF, your color material finish document. And this is an actual real CMF for a real product that I worked on. Um, and every single part literally has a color, which is usually Panatone color. These are standard color things that everybody uses to test. It gives you the material, which can affect your finishes, et cetera. It gives you a finish. So there's a standard set of finishes around almost every given material as to whether like, uh, I think the MT10101 is a high gloss finish. Um, uh, the camo lens might be polished. There might be um, other ones which might be sandblasted. Um, so each of these codes has a very specific finish. And this, these are used or understood by your industrial design team, if you have one. Those are the folks with the, um, the uh, black turtlenecks and the weird glasses. Um, they're the ones who do all of these things and will handle it for you. Uh, but your CMFs can drive an incredible amount of cost. So if you have very high gloss finishes, uh, that's going to drive your cost way up because your tooling is going to be a lot more expensive with a high gloss. So you have to understand the implications of those finishes. Word of warning, soft touch paint, don't use it. It's a nightmare to maintain. Just don't use soft touch paint if you can avoid it. Um, so you've got that CMF document, and this document is used to design your processes, design your tools, design the final finish, and also to say whether or not you've achieved that quality that you've specified. Okay, so the next thing that happens is you have to actually package this product. So you've got this product, but then if you've ever gotten a, an Apple uh, iPhone and had that beautiful box, uh, and there's what's called a case made box with an origami paper insert and a bunch of manuals and various different liftoffs. And you've got the whole unboxing experience. It was a big thing for a while. There's all these videos on unboxing. Uh, you have to design that gift box. And oh, by the way, you have to buy that gift box. And those gift boxes can be very, very expensive. So case made boxes, which are the boxes where it looks like it's a wrapped present as opposed to a folded cardboard box. Uh, those case-made boxes can be three to four dollars each. They can be quite expensive, but you also might have point-of-sale boxes. So what is it going to look like at the front of your counter? You then have a series of packaging that's used to ship it, which includes your uh, inner box and your master carton, um, and these all also have to be specified. 
Those master cartons are then packed on pallets. So you have to actually design what the pallet stacking is so that we know how that's gonna be transmitted. And then that pallet stacking also has to have a mapping into a container or some kind of other shipping, whether it's air freight or others. And very, so what people don't realize early on is, is very, very small changes in the gift box can affect your shipping costs. Because if you make your gift box a little bit bigger, you then might not necessarily be able to use the full container or the full pallet, which means you can't use the full container. Okay. So it's really interesting watching how Apple got rid of the um, you know, little white block that's in every, that we used to get with our phones. Um, the generic, the, the term, the jargon or the industry jargon term for that little white block, the charging block, we call it a wall wart. Um, it looks like a wart on a wall. Um, if you notice, Apple's not shipping those anymore. They don't include them. You have to buy those separately. Um, and one of the reasons is that I'm deducing is one, there's been some changes in the CEC certifications. That's the, the energy certifications around wall warts. Um, and I suspect that they probably couldn't pass them or they didn't want to recertify them. So they're just not shipping them. Um, and also now the packaging is quite a bit smaller and quite a bit lighter, which I suspect means that their shipping costs have dropped down. So if you look at the original iPhone boxes, they were much larger uh, than they are now. They've really brought those in as much as possible in order to get the shipping costs as low as possible. So there's a lot of thinking that you have to do on this to think about it. Uh, and some long-term implications of how that product gets shipped and your cost of shipping. Okay, so that leads into cost. Let me just check my time. And please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I will quite happily take a sip of water if anybody's got questions. Okay, so um, you have to also, as you're going along in your bill of materials, your drawings, your CMF, all of these are going to, your packaging, all have implications on cost. And you're gonna to need to know how much does each part cost? What is your cost of goods sold? That's how much does it cost when it leaves the factory? You're gonna to have to know your landed costs. How much is that gonna cost you to get to your customer? You need to know your non-recurring engineering, how much tooling and fixed cost you have. And you have to be able to know what your cash flow is. So really good entrepreneurs, as they go into this process, calculate part cost, cost of goods, landed cost, non-recurring engineering, and cash flow almost on a daily basis. So they're really watching that incredibly closely because a very small change in your cost of goods can have dramatic impacts on your, uh, whether or not your product is viable. So this is just kind of a, a quick slide just to kind of give you a sense of what's involved in your cost of goods or your various different costs. Uh, you have your material costs, which is really your bill of materials costs. You have to pay for your accessories and your packaging. And that gives you how much does it cost to just to buy all the parts that go into that. That then typically has a markup, which includes a scrap rate. So your factory will give you a standard scrap rate. You'll have an assembly labor uh, cost or how much is it gonna cost to actually assemble that product. And then there's gonna be a markup and a profit, whether that's an overhead, if it's an internal factory or a markup of profit, if it's an external factory. Um, and that gives you your cost of goods sold. So that's how much does it cost you to produce it? Then you have your landed costs, which includes your customs, your shifting and your distribution costs. Then there's the sale price, which includes your gross profit minus your warranty costs. So you have to set aside, there's a whole bunch of stuff on warranty that you have to pay attention to and understand. And then you have your retailer gross profit, which is uh, if you're selling through a distributor or another retailer, they're gonna take a profit off of that. So. One thing to realize, and I would say it's one of the big mistakes people make, is the difference between price and cost. Price is what you get, cost is what you spend. Okay, so when you talk about those two, always make sure that you're using the right term on that. So there's a whole bunch of different costs that you need to be able to uh, manage in here. But one thing to note is, is that if you look at these material costs, any small change in your material costs are going to have huge trickle up effects and magnifying effects. Um, into the rest of your stack up. So anything that you can do to keep your material costs down and understand those, um, the better you're going to be at keeping these other ones up because these other costs are typically set as a percentage of your uh, materials costs. 
So it's a lot. And there's a bunch of tools to use to do cost estimates. Um, I like using, well, I use a, a program called A Priori, which is a software program used by a lot of industry folks. Um, we get it for free, which is very nice. Um, but uh, you can use things like Proto Labs, you can use Fictive uh, that have automatic ways of um, estimating costs. Now, a lot of the Avnets um and um arrows of the world now have apis where you can upload bill of materials and they'll do cost estimates for your bill of materials for purchase parts grangers have got another one as well so you can you have to sometimes hunt around to find those costs uh but you can usually get a pretty good estimate there's a lot of estimators for pcbas there's a bunch of pcba suppliers uh, printed circuit board assembly suppliers where you can estimate those as well okay so the other big part that people always forget is you have to spend a lot. That's what it takes to build the product, but there's going to be a bunch of money that you have to spend before you get that first product off the line. And this is what we call our non-recurring engineering costs. Oh, wrong way. Um, and this includes things like your engineering costs, especially if you're outsourcing. Um, I had one company that went bankrupt because they had a bad con uh, contract with their app supplier. They ran out of money right before they were about to ship. The app supplier got tired of not getting paid and they dug their heels and said, we're not delivering till we get paid. And the company said, well, I can't pay you until we deliver. Uh, they both went into a standoff and they both went bankrupt. Um, so it's always good to make sure you've got enough money to pay at least a portion or get a sample or like buy it in chunks so that you can actually get all the parts that you need to have done. Um, that was a really unfortunate standoff. Uh, but you have the engineering, you have different services, consulting services. Um, tooling is gonna be one of your biggest costs. So if you wanna build, let's say the tool to make the cover on here, this is a high gloss part. Um, a single draw there's no lifters there's no side actions on it um that's probably as a single uh cavity oh, it's, well it's probably a four eight cavity mold if it's a four eight cavity mold it's probably around fourteen to fifteen thousand dollars for four cavity mold for that part okay they're expensive so your molding and your tooling are going to be especially if you do any kind of injection molding parts any kind of casting um any kind of forming those are going to be really expensive and they add up really, really quickly. And that's probably one of your biggest expenses is going to be that tooling cost. You're going to have to pay for all your sample runs. So again, the more, remember we talked about cash flow at the beginning, the more pilot runs you have, the more money you have to spend. Um, and those pilot runs are expensive. So you want to have your pilot runs actually be valid. So you're not spending a lot of money that you don't need to. Uh, your testing costs, so your environmental testing, your life testing for a simple electronics device like this um, is probably somewhere around, depending on the uh, life testing, if you have to do UV or if you have to do all these other things, that's probably around ten dollars to $15,000 just to do all of the life cycle and durability testing for a small electronics product. Um, and then your certifications, so certifications for a single country is going to be somewhere between thirteen and twenty thousand dollars, depending on what it is that you're building. You need to have the certifications done, and almost all products will require certification. These are things like your FCC, your UL, your WE, your ROHOS, etc. Those are all of the really weird little labels on the bottom of your like. Let's see if I get it. See all those little weird labels? You have to pay to put each one of those things on there. Okay, and that can be somewhere between twelve and thirteen thousand dollars. So one of the things, little pieces of advice as we go through this, um, pick two countries. Don't sell into every country in the world. Pick two countries. U.S., Canada certifications. You can actually share a lot of certifications across them, and then pick Europe. But don't sell anywhere else until uh, you get enough of attraction. But if you start having to sell into these other countries, you have to pay for each country's certification. They're not standard. Uh, across the wet part. And then you're going to have to pay for production line fixtures and test fixtures. So these are things like your integrated circuit testing, your templates, um, use of AOI inspection, any kind of uh, built in testing, etc. You're going to have to pay for all of that testing equipment to be on the factory line. 
So before you can produce anything, and these costs for a hardware electronics, uh, like a consumer electronics, can be upwards of like seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars by the time you add up all of that cost. Okay. You really, it's really hard to do a, a hardware device in high volume for less than about a million in terms of all of those costs involved. So one of the things you've got to do when you're playing with this, uh, when you're going through this process is get what we call the valley of death. Um, and this is the idea that you have to spend, you spend, you spend, you spend, you spend, you spend, and you have to have enough cash to get through that amount where you are have spent a ton and you're just starting to make profit. Okay, and that's what we call the valley of death. Um, and again, the more of these cycles you have, like this tech transfer to product launch is really short. That should be about this long. Uh, this is where most of the expenses, I need to recreate this graph to make it actually be right. Um, but you're spending an incredible amount of money in this space. And if you have two or three or four extra cycles, you're just putting yourself deeper and deeper in that hole. Okay. Okay, so a couple of other things, because I want to make sure I've got some time. You have to have a quality plan, uh, which means you have to define how you're going to test this product to ensure that it can survive use, views, production errors, uh, and legal missteps. Um, there's going to be a bunch of different quality test plans you have to create from your bench testing through your pilot testing, inline, burn in, shipment audit, uh, and ongoing production testing. So you have to define all of those things to make sure that you're continuing to be aligned with success. And there's a bunch of parts to that. You have to do your functional testing, durability, reliability, aesthetics, um, and then your uh, validation testing or your user testing. And then you also have to do your certification testing as well. So all of these documents, uh, functional testing, each one is probably going to be a two or three page document for each functional test to create that standard operating procedure for that. Okay, so that's just a few of the documents there's probably another 10 that i didn't go through including process documentation control plans uh shipment audits etc there's a uh, svc charts um, there's a whole bunch of other ones that you do need to learn about um what i'm hoping today is is you've got a sense of um you know having a working prototype and a cad model is only the first step now obviously you have to start with that make sure you've got a really good spec document because everything gets driven off of that. Make sure you've got a comprehensive set of drawings, a comprehensive bill of materials, and a comprehensive quality test plan. Um, where companies have not had those in place and they're playing catch up and they're creating them on the fly, uh, that's where things get missed. Errors get made, pro uh, problems get uh, found. Um, and usually that's at the point where you're spending a lot of money. Get a handle on your costs early on, even if they're estimates, uh, because ultimately you have to be able to make sure that you can sell this thing at a uh, cost. And uh, Excel sheets, while they're great, uh, are only Excel sheets. You have to get those cost models and you have to get real numbers. Finance people like to pull numbers out of thin air and then somehow they become real and then they're surprised when your supplier comes in at five times the cost. So getting that cost estimate as early as you can is a really good idea. Um, and I've got a bunch of suggestions in the textbook about how to do that, different tools, different methods, different ways of going about finding out those cost structures. So any questions? I don't see any questions on the chat. This is a quiet group today, but <laughs> if anyone wants to come off mute, you're more than welcome to. So is everybody, uh, if everybody just kind of do thumbs up, th was this uh, a little bit more overwhelming than you thought it was going to be? Jose, you're the only one who's on, so I can see you nodding, thank you. Um, it sounds like, uh, yeah, this is a lot, right? Yeah, it, it is a lot. Um, I've been accused of sucking the air out of entrepreneur rooms because it's like, <laughs> oh my God, I gotta do all this stuff. But the fact is, is that it's, um, how applicable is software development of these processes? I don't really do software. Um, but you do have to do all of your testing. You do have to have a good spec document. Um, I would say those two are probably the most the most similar. Like the better you can be at defining your spec document, the better you're going to be off later on. And the other thing to pay attention to is these are living documents. Um, these are documents in the same way that you would never expect to write a piece of code for the code person or 
create a CAD file and assume that you got it right on the first try. Like no one would ever assume that you're not gonna go back and fix something, right? So why would you think that of any other document? Your spec document, your quality test plan, your bill of materials are living documents. They are your current interpretation given the information you have. You're going through a test process and you're updating that documentation to reflect that learning so that that learning becomes embedded in the design. So you can learn something out of a test and unless it makes a change, that was a useless test. So you always are gonna want, make sure that you're thinking about these documents are not just documents, they are the definition of your product. They are not the definition, CAD is the definition of your geometry. These are the definition of the product. And this is how we comprehensively define a product that is saleable in the market. And it's a lot of work. Yeah, and again, feel free to reach out to me through LinkedIn. Um, I've got a number of uh, little blogs that I've been writing on LinkedIn, just kind of short little pieces. Um, I'm a little behind on my planned schedule of writing one a month. I'm about three months behind already, <laughs> as one does. Um, and, uh, but again, learn, investigate, use the glossary, it's okay to have a blank stare when you're in a meeting and you're like, I have no idea what they're talking about. Ask questions, ask for definitions. Uh, you're gonna be, uh, one of the things I discovered this process, you're gonna be on a steep, steep learning curve. Um, and just so you know, I'm always on a steep learning curve. Like I see I'm Ho really bored if I'm not. <laughs> I see Jose has a hand raised. Oh yeah, Jose, what was the? Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so my, my name is Jose Lemus and I'm a community impact uh, fellow at MHub in Chicago. And so my, my project is working on understanding how to lower barriers to hard tech commercialization for uh, women and minority uh, founders. Um, so I had a question around your textbook and the resources you, you were sharing with us. Um, obviously, uh, navigating this process requires a lot of detail and a lot of commitment to the process, not just fabrication, but to kind of the process of and knowing the costs and business aspects of your, of your product. Uh, how would you recommend teaching some of these topics so that uh, to new founders, to individuals that are getting into the hard tech fabrication process, it, would you say it's sequential or how, would you, how have you seen results uh, with kind of navigating the resources you're sharing and, and getting the most out of it to be prepared for, um, for launch? Yeah, so um, I've got this really wonderful woman, Suzanne Sinatra, who uh, developed um, this great fem, uh, feminine product uh, for, anyway, she, it's this really cool product. I won't go into a lot of details, but she was uh, or is an underrepresented minority, had no engineering experience at all. She had this idea for this product, um, it's a company called Private Packs. I'm happy to introduce you to her so you can talk to her about how she did it. Um, she was incredibly proactive. She cornered me about five years ago in a meeting and said, I need to know what you know. She found me and I've been mentoring. I have a, a policy where I'll mentor any woman uh, in hardware, any, I'll give a couple of hours to any woman in hardware, any minority in hardware, um, just because that's my way of giving back. Um, and so I spent a lot of time with Suzanne. She just launched her product. Um, but I think it's about understanding or teaching people to understand that they aren't gonna know everything that they're gonna be getting into. And so even those people who have been on, who are on this call who have PhDs and MDs and everything like that are still learning, All right? And I think it's this idea that you can, everybody in this phase, who, if they haven't gone through it before, even if they have gone through it before, are learning, okay? And so, by creating, I think the thing that really impressed me about Suzanne was that she was not afraid to ask for help and she was not afraid to show what she didn't know. And I think that's what made her so successful because she just went out and just cornered people and went, I need to know how to do this. I don't understand this. I need to learn this. And so I think if you can foster that level of um, humility and curiosity combined, of I don't know it and I need to know it and I need to go find out. Uh, you can, anybody with, even without an engineering degree can do this. And I would say, if I look at all of my successful entrepreneurs, they had that similar, 
I don't know what I'm doing and I'm gonna ask for help. Um, and that combination of those two things have made them incredibly successful, if that makes sense to you. So I think anything that you can do to reduce the stigma around asking for help um, and making that normative is only gonna help people who already feel like they're not, they don't know anything, feel better about it. Yeah, because honestly, I'm still learning this stuff. I would be really, really bored if I wasn't learning something. I'm teaching myself to weave right now because I just needed another project. So I'm I'm getting into eight shaft weaving because, um, and it's, I'm really, really bad at it. But I'm having fun because I'm learning and I get better and then I push the limits and I get better and, you know, eventually I'll get bored with it and move on to something else. But uh, but I think that's the, the thing to really emphasize. Okay, well, again, feel free to reach out. Um, ask for help. I'm happy to point you in the direction of resources or other things. At some point, I'm going to get back out to the Midwest. I miss the Mid I'm, I'm a Midwesterner, so it's been a long time since I've been out there, but uh, um, I think it's been a long time since anybody's been anywhere. Um, <laughs> but I'm looking for. I'm looking forward to getting. Uh, oddly enough, it's the first in my life I've ever been looking forward to getting on a plane. Well, thank you so much, Anna. These have been great uh, presentations, and we'll figure out some ways to re-engage with you um, moving forward. But we really appreciate your time. I did post, and I, I will. We will send this out to those of you who attended the um, information, the link to the previous. Uh, video. So, and this will be on our YouTube probably sometime by the end of next week. So thank you so much to everyone who attended. We have many more workshops. We hope to see you at some of them later on this summer. Have a great day, everyone. Okay. Thanks so much. It was great talking with all of you.